Washington History Museum's Port Hampton Lecture. Uh, Happy New Year. I hope uh, the new year is treating you well. Uh, tonight we have a speaker from uh, Joint Base uh, Langley Eustis, and uh, he's going to talk to us a bit tonight about uh, uh, downtown Hampton and the extensive archaeological investigations that it's been subject to over the years. Uh, those excavations and the records of the 18th century Elizabeth City County revealed that the residents of Hampton worked hard to stay up to date on the latest news and fashions coming from the center of the English-speaking uh, world. Uh, speaking to us about this tonight, Christopher uh, McDade is currently the lead archaeologist for Joint Base Yang Langley Eustis. He has worked uh, for the U.S. Army as a regional archaeologist, as a field archaeologist for the William and Mary Center for Archaeological Research, and for the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation Department of Archaeological Research. He holds a Ph.D. from the University of Leicester School of Archaeology and Ancient History. His PhD thesis was on the archaeology of Hampton's Bunch of Grapes and King's Arms Taverns. So he's particularly expert in the area. Uh, please uh, feel free to comment throughout the uh, course of the lecture on Facebook for us. And if you have questions, submit those as a comment and we'll be submitting those to, uh, to Mr. McDade at the end of his lecture and we'll hope, hopefully get some answers for you. So with that, I will stand out of the way and have Chris begin his talk, A Very Agreeable Place and All the Houses Extremely Neat. All right. Good evening, everybody. Uh, it's redundant, but I'm Chris McDade, and I'm going to talk about some of the archaeology that's been done in Hampton. Uh, some of it I had the opportunity to be involved in, and others was, other work was done by some other folks. Uh, the quote, a very agreeable place and all the houses extremely neat. Let me do a little tech thing here. Dun, dun, dun. Comes from uh, a diary of a woman named Charlotte Brown who was traveling with Braddock's army during the French and Indian War, and she stopped in Hampton and in fact had a meal at the Bunch of Grapes Tavern. And so we'll talk about the Bunch of Grapes and some of the other taverns that have been found through the extensive amount of archaeological work that's been done in downtown Hampton. But before I, uh, there we go. Before I jump into the archaeology, there's some thanks that need to be done. Archaeology is not a solo endeavor. If you've ever been to an archaeological site, you know there are always uh, several archaeologists working together to accomplish anything, and that's partnered with re his historical researchers and the people that are experts in ceramics and various and sundry things like that. So for tonight's talk, I wanted to thank uh, Seamus here at the History Museum and uh, Rob Hunter and uh, Nick Lucchetti and Hank Lutton. Nick and Hank were uh, with the James River Institute for Archaeology, and Nick still is. Hank has moved on. But they, were in, they did some of the excavations I'm going to talk about. When I worked at William & Mary Center for Archaeological Research, Don Linebaugh and Rob Hunter and Tom Higgins directed the excavations under where the Air and Space Museum is now and the carousel uh, here in downtown Hampton. And then when I was working on my uh, doctoral thesis, uh, Mike Cobb, formerly of the Hampton History Museum, and Bethany Austin, who is, I believe, still here at the museum, were very helpful in getting to the raw data and the artifacts and finding the material that I needed. So I just thought a shout out would be a good thing. Okay, taverns in Colonial Virginia. This talk is going to focus on the colonial era and the colonial era taverns that have been excavated in Hampton. Um, they're sometimes called taverns, they're sometimes called ordinaries. There's not a real distinction between the two except for time period. Ordinary tends to be used through the 17th century and into the 18th century, and as the 18th century transitions into the 19th century, the term tavern becomes more common. The big distinction drawn in the colonial period is between an ordinary or a tavern and something called a tippling house. A tippling house was where just liquor was served and they were illegal in colonial Virginia. Another aspect about taverns that folks should be aware of is the view 
of taverns and ordinaries held by the powers that were powerful in colonial Virginia, and that's that ordinaries and taverns were necessary evils. You needed to have a place where travelers could get food, sleep, because traveling was a necessity, but they didn't really like them for a variety of reasons, so they were heavily regulated. After 1661, the regulations passed to the county. So Elizabeth City County, which is the county that the town of Hampton was in, Hampton eventually incorporates all of Elizabeth City County. Um, so the official licensing agency for Hampton's taverns were the Elizabeth City County Court. Now, when you look at laws as they were passed in the colonial period, one of the things that I find interesting is you can tell what issues the legislators had with the particular topic. So if you read the acts about tavern regulation, you can understand what concerns the legislators, the House of Burgesses had. And so in the 1644 act, for instance, the title is for repressing the excessive rates extracted by ordinary keepers. So in this case, they're concerned that the public is being overcharged. So they set the charge. How much can an ordinary keeper charge for a meal? The, an the answer was 10 pounds of tobacco. Now one point, and this will come up uh, again in this talk, you should keep in mind the difference between the British currency, the pound sterling, right? That's the thing that has the little L shape before it, and pounds of tobacco. In colonial Virginia, pounds of tobacco, the actual weight of the tobacco plant, was used as a currency. So the prices in this ordinary law are in pounds of tobacco. Wine or strong liquor sell was sold at a rate of eight pounds of tobacco per gallon. Uh, one thing that I found interesting is this last bullet that says debts made for wine or strong waters, that means spirits, um, are not pleadable. So you couldn't get the money back. If, you, uh, if a tavern keeper gave you credit, they may not be able to get it back. Uh, now, this is uh, an act a few years later for preventing many disorders and riots in ordinaries and other places where drink is retailed. So again, they're concerned about disorderly behavior in the ordinaries or riots in the ordinaries. So this says you have to get a license from the county. Um, it has to be signed on and the bond has to be given and you have to put up a bond of 150 pounds of tobacco. So again, the General Assembly is concerned, the House of Burgesses, with the behavior that happens in taverns and that they are a place of disorder. So regulating them because they are a necessary function is important. So Elizabeth City County Court, uh, when I was going through the records, uh, they are inconsistent in their governance of taverns and ordinaries. Now, some of that it may be a function of the fact that not all of the records have survived. And so there are gaps where there are no records, so clearly there's no evidence of them regulating taverns. However, in the records that do exist, they are pretty spotty. I went through the records from 1740 to 1770 and would and found haphazard issuing of licenses, setting of prices. Most times prices were set and it just said same as last year. And it would say same as last year for five, six, seven, eight years in a row. Um, this is just an example from the 1690s and early 1700s where one year they gave out four licenses in Hampton one year they gave out none, one year they gave out two. Um, they often gave them in Hampton. There was one of the town acts in the 1690s limited the number of ordinaries in, town, in a town to two. Uh, when that ordinance was passed, Hampton had six. 
So four of the licenses were revoked. Um, I don't know if that means the taverns was sh were shut down or not. It just means their license was revoked. So there is a, uh, taverns are uh, highly regulated and a concern to the powers that be powerful. So I mentioned that taverns were, the county court was required to set the rates and that the Elizabeth City County didn't always do it. Um, here the, here's what the rates were in November of 1692. Um, rum was four shillings a gallon, brandy was six shillings a gallon, uh, Madeira and St. George's wine and claret, you can see that. One of the things that I have found compelling about what liquor and wines and spirits people could get in Hampton Taverns is how diverse it was, how it came from many different places, right? Rum is made with sugar out of the Caribbean and is distilled oftentimes in the Caribbean. Uh, brandy, depending on what kind it was, could be made in Europe, could be made um, in America uh, from locally grown fruit. Madeira is a wine that comes from uh, the Madeira Islands um, in Portugal. Uh, St. George's wine, I had to look up. There is a town called um, uh, Nuit St. George. Um, I've killed that pronunciation, and anybody who speaks French, I apologize. Uh, but the town in France has been making wine since the Middle Ages and was shipping it to colonial Virginia. Clarets of Burgundy, that's coming from France. Punch is a drink that sort of typifies the British Empire. It's rum, it's sugar, it's spices, it's lemons, and the term punch may well be a reference to a Hindi word meaning five, because the traditional recipe for punch had five ingredients. And so punch was served communally um, in big bowls, when the bowls were passed around. So punch is a expensive drink and is the drink of um, wealthy, upwardly mobile types of folks. Flip is a, another colonial drink. It's rum and sugar and egg whites frothed up and then you stuck a hot poker in it and it boiled over and it was served in, again in big punch-like bowls. So the takeaway from the price list is even in the late 17th century, Hampton as a port town is doing commerce with the world. It's getting its drinks from the Caribbean, from Europe. It's getting ideas for drinks and ingredients from drinks from India. So it is a cosmopolitan center. Now, I'm gonna talk a little about the archeology span that's been done in Hampton. And I wanted to mention a man named uh, Joseph Benthal. He, in the 1970s, did a series of archeological excavations here in Hampton. And you can see some of the sites, the second church site, Mill Point, found some fascinating individual artifacts, but most importantly, I think, proved that there were intact archeological deposits in downtown Hampton. One of the things that you will hear in discussions with folks that haven't done a lot of archeology span in urban settings or the general public often, they are uh, skeptical that any intact and significant archeological deposits can be found in an area that's been built on over and over and over again such as downtown Hampton. But when you explain to them that there are intact archeological deposits still in Rome, still in London, still in Philadelphia, and as uh, Joe Benthal proved, still in Hampton. And so that's I th one of the reasons that additional work was done is that he proved there not only is archeological material still intact in the ground in downtown Hampton, but that it's significant and uh, has a role to play in teaching us about colonial American history. 
So now that we're talking about archaeology, a little archaeology 101 for folks that don't have a whole lot of familiarity with archaeology. Um, site, right? Archaeologists always talk about an archaeological site. Basic definition of an archaeological site is a place where people did stuff and left material. And that's generally how we organize excavations. We excavate a site. In Virginia, most sites, though not all, start with the number 44. That's a system developed in the 1930s. It's called the Smithsonian Trinomial System, in which the state the municipality in the state and then the number of the site are all strung together. So all in that system, Virginia is 44, Hampton is HT, and then the number of the recorded site. So the uh, site that uh, is now the Air and Space Museum was 44 HT 38, and the site that is where the carousel is now is 44 HT 39. Um, I'm not going to use the site numbers because the sites have names that will also help people locate them sort of in a mental map. Uh, I will also mention the term feature a lot, um, archaeological feature, as in how was, how was that uh, archaeological site? It had a lot of features. Um, a feature is the best way it's been explained to me is it's the things you can, they are the things you cannot take back to the laboratory. So. On these sites in Hampton, we found many brick-lined cellars with material in them. We found many wells with material in them. You could dig the material out of the cellars, but that left you, and you'll see some pictures, uh, with an empty cellar. Well, you didn't take the cellar back to the lab. You took the artifacts. So the cellar is the feature. The artifacts are the feature fill. The well is the feature, the material in the well is the feature fill or the, or the artifacts. Artifacts, things people make, um, pottery, stone tools, uh, knives, metal, pretty much gun flints, anything that people make is an artifact. Archaeologists love any artifact that changes through time. If it Changes through time, we can use it to figure out how old a site is, how old uh, an archaeological deposit is. So we spend a lot of time understanding the manufacturing history of artifacts, be they stone tools, be they Native American ceramics, be they European ceramics. Uh, and so in this talk tonight, you'll see a lot of tobacco pipes, uh, wine bottles, uh, ceramic plates and bowls, and things like that. And we can date those. So we will know that a archaeological deposit is from 1720 because it has a piece of pottery that is called white salt clay stoneware. And so that's how we determine the age of things, is by the kind of artifacts they contain. And since ceramics and glass are fragile. The fact that they break a lot means you tend to find a lot of them in the archaeological record. And what's nice about them is once they break and become very small pieces of ceramic, pieces of glass, then they're pretty much indestructible. And they'll last for literally thousands of years in the ground. So artifacts that change through time we like, ceramics and glass we really like. So these are the four sites that I'm going to be talking about this evening. The Old Point Bank site, the Goodyear Tire Shop site, where the Air and Space Museum is and where the carousel is now. So we're going to talk now about the Old Point Bank site. Here's some of the specifications. It was excavated through the summer and fall of 2010. The, the excavators found two colonial cellars, two other dwellings, um, some outbuildings. Right? Outbuildings are kitchens and laundries and well houses and things like that. Uh, an 18th century cow burial and more than a thousand features. So that's trash pits, holes for fence posts, holes for um, cellars, 
So they found a large amount of material. Let's try that. One of the uh, most significant changes over the course of archaeology during the course of my career is the emphasis that's now placed on involving the public, getting the public to know about, be excited about, understand archaeology, how it's done, why it's done, why it's important, because the history that I'm talking about is the history of everybody that lives in the city of Hampton and getting them involved and excited about their history and what things make Hampton a unique place is a role for archaeology, and the folks at the James River Institute for Archaeology do that very, very well. As you can see, there are lots of people that came to learn about the archaeology when it was being conducted at this site. Um, I will just, as a personal note, uh, mention that uh, the little girl in the yellow hat's my daughter, and I'm the guy in the black hat. Um, and so my daughter and I went out, and we uh, participated with the public in the excavation of this site, and it was a, a really good time. Oh, as a, uh, also, as, as an aside, I am talking this evening about um, the late 17th and 18th century colonial history of Hampton. There is an extensive amount of archaeology that's been done in Hampton that falls outside of the downtown area and is not of those time periods. The William Ray Center for Archaeological Research conducted a significant excavation when the Pentran bus station was expanded in the 1990s. And more recently, the James River Institute for Archaeology worked on the Grand Contraband Camp. So the Pentran site was from the very early 17th century, 1620s, 1630s, something like that. The Grand Contraband Camp is during and after the American Civil War. So Hampton has a much broader history and much broader archaeology than I'm talking about this evening. So this is a picture of the site after it rains. Um, you spend a lot of time bailing out archaeological sites when they're big like this and it rains a lot. But this just shows you the scale of the archaeological excavation that was conducted at this site. So I talked about brick cellars and those being features. This is a brick cellar. Uh, you can see it has stairs going down. Let's see if I can make this work. Here, yeah, so you can, hopefully you folks can see the stairs there. You can see this was probably a brick building that is a huge amount of brick rubble inside that cellar. You can see the deposit, the uh, archeologist there, who I think is Hank Lutton, is probably two, two and a half feet deep of brick rubble. That is a extensive amount, indicating that it was probably entire, an entire brick building. Uh, brick architecture, becomes pretty common in Virginia starting around 1730 or so. For the wealthy folks, it starts in the middle of the 17th century, 1650, 1660, places like Bacon's Castle in Surrey. But for less wealthy folks, you tend to get either brick buildings being a story and a half tall or so in about 1720, 1730, or brick foundations within two or two and a half story frame buildings on top of them. And that transition from an older kind of uh, architecture called earth fast, which I'll explain in a second, and brick architecture is one of the big changes in colonial Virginia and it signals a change across the way people lived in colonial Virginia, well, wealthy folks and folks that wanted to be wealthy, how they lived and decisions they made about how they would spend their money and try and impress people. There, that's a keep people in suspense. So this is a uh, trash pit. Archaeology is a destructive discipline. It's a destructive science. We take apart that which we are studying. And so when you start your excavation, you have the trash pit that is full of artifacts, and information. When you are done, you have an empty hole in the ground. So hopefully you have gotten all of the artifacts and all of the information out of the feature, out of the site.
because a lot of people think the, that archaeology is about the artifacts, that it's about the stuff. And that's not entirely true. What archaeologists are really trying to do is understand the relationship between the artifacts, between and amongst the features, so we can understand how the people that made the sites and left the artifacts, where they left the artifacts, how that changes through time and understanding the context of the artifacts is exceptionally important in trying to do that. If you know where the wine bottles come from and where the tobacco t pipes come from, you can, start if, you can start talking about what they mean. If all you know is that there's a tobacco pipe, well, we know people had tobacco pipes in the past, that doesn't help us. But knowing where it comes from and how it relates to the rest of the site, to the rest of the community, the rest of the colony, allows us to talk about how colonial society changed over time. So the, ar the artifacts from this trash pit were decidedly domestic. That's a quote from the, from the archeological report which raises an issue about taverns. Taverns are difficult to determine archeologically sometimes because the things that you do in a tavern and the things that you do in a house are the same things. You eat, you drink, you smoke tobacco pipes, you sleep, you carouse on occasion. So finding a whole bunch of, finding domestic artifacts could mean it's a house. When you come to taverns, it tends to be a matter of scale. You tend to find a lot of domestic artifacts, more than you find typically associated with a private home. So these are some of the artifacts that were recovered. Uh, case and wine bottle glasses, case and wine bottle glass, Case bottles are square, uh, glass used primarily for liquor. Uh, wine bottles are used for wine and other things. They're recycled a lot, they're used for a lot of different purposes. Um, meal consumption, oysters, clams, crabs, fish scales. Um, and in the bottom paragraph you see uh, Staffordshire modeled glazed ware in North Devon. These are English ceramics. The English archaeologists and American archaeologists interested in the colonial period have spent a lot of time going through the records and conducting excavations in Staffordshire, which is one of the major pottery manufacturing areas in England. They were making pottery before industrial, the, the Industrial Revolution, and then as the Industrial Revolution kicks off, they start making pottery by literally the boatload and shipping it all over the world, and particularly to Virginia. So these are the kinds of things that were found at this tavern at the uh, Old Point site. Those are the reconstructed wine bottles. If you were expecting wine bottles that were more cylindrical, those develop towards the end of the 18th century. These bottles, of wine was not aged in them. These were primarily for uh, serving wine, so the tavern keeper, ordinary keeper, would have a cask, and you would order your Madeira, your Fat Canary, your Vidoma, your St. George's, and they would put it into the bottle and bring it to you. This is a type of pottery uh, that was made not in Staffordshire, but in Wales. It's called buckleyware. It is a very utilitarian type of ware. Uh, it's made in Wales in the first half of the 18th century. Um, this is a butter storage, um, it's a butter dish, basically, for storing butter. I keep hitting the wrong button, I apologize. Um, one of the things that you do find more so, or at least in my experience, you find more in tavern contexts, tavern trash pits, tavern cellars than you do in domestic, in home, in private homes, are coins. Um, these are not legal tender, these are called jetons, but they were used as currency in colonial Virginia. These are from 
the first 15 or 20 years of the uh, 18th century. So I think the date on them was 1714. But you do find coins, and you'll see that again, several other taverns have coins find, found in them. Coins are very rare in colonial Virginia. And the fact that many of the coins that have been found are Spanish um, is interesting. And I'll talk a little bit about why that's interesting a little later. All right, we're now going to move on to the Goodyear site. We're just going to move a block through downtown Hampton. So this was excavated in 2004 and 2005. Uh, you can see they found multiple buildings, multiple outbuildings, multiple wells, lots of features, a lot of refuse pits. So these are very densely packed sites. There's a lot of archaeological material, and excavating them requires a certain amount of uh, caution because it's easy to get confused as to which things line up and which things go with which other things. So I mentioned earlier that the transition from an earlier style of architecture to brick architecture is a big deal in colonial Virginia. The earlier kind of architecture is called earth-fast architecture. And earth-fast architecture is used from the beginning of colonial Virginia history. They found they have earth-fast constructed buildings at Jamestown. And earthfast basically means the structural support posts for the building go directly into the ground. So you would frame up a wall, but make the studs, the principal studs, four feet longer than you needed to. And then you would dig a four foot deep hole in the ground and you would put the posts right into the ground and build your house that way. Um, it was fast, it was cheap, and it didn't require a whole lot of carpentry skill. And so in 17th century Virginia and early 18th century Virginia, the vast majority of homes and buildings are earth-fast construction. Starting, as I mentioned, in about 17, I'm sorry, 1650, 1660, the very wealthy start the transition to fully brick homes. The wealthy part of the middling sort, so sort of the rich in counties, started making brick homes or making houses on full brick foundations in 1720, 1730. And this Goodyear site is an example of that. So the, there was a building that was built around 1691. Hampton as a town doesn't come into being until 1691, 1692. So it's a very early building for the town of Hampton. It's on land owned by the Walker family. Now, I briefly looked as I was putting uh, this talk together for evidence that a Walker held a ordinary license and I couldn't find it. Um, it may, may mean I didn't look thoroughly enough. It may mean there, that particular record hasn't survived, but it can also mean that the Walkers who were a fairly wealthy family build a building and rented it out, and the tenant got the ordinary license. We find that happening at the Air and Space Museum where Mrs. Taylor ran her tavern for about 20 years, and then Mr. Riddlehurst ran his tavern for about 10 or 15 years, and then he buys the building from the owner. A man named uh, Wilson owned the building, but Mrs. Taylor ran her tavern in it, and Mr. Riddlehurst ran his tavern in it until he buys the place uh, a little later in his career. So the Earth Fest building that had the tavern in it um, is running from the 1690s and is destroyed in the 1730s. And you will note the bullet says, replaced by a substantial brick dwelling. So that's that transition from Earth Fest architecture to brick architecture. With that transition, there's also a transition regarding um, all sorts of other material culture. The dishes you had, the clothes you wore, the, the drinks you drank, all sort of change in that time period. All right, there's an overview of the site. 
That's people conducting the excavation. You will see the archaeological material in there. Um, one thing that I find fascinating about archaeology is there are any number of ways to conduct an archaeological excavation. So you will see in the pictures of the Old Point Comfort Site, that's me telling me I've got to wrap up in a few minutes, the Old Point Comfort Site, the Air and Space Site, the Carousel Site, all dug using different methodologies, all of them appropriate methodologies, just different, depending on the situation and who was leading the excavation. So tobacco pipes, tobacco bowls, Spanish silver pieces minted in Peru. So this tavern is running in the 1690s, 1700s, 1720s. That the coins were printed in per, minted in Peru in the 1650s and 60s. Spanish silver coins were accepted everywhere throughout the English colonial system because they didn't lose their value because they were really silver. One point to make is transporting Spanish silver from the Spanish colonial system into the English colonial system was patently illegal. Not allowed at all. But you find the Spanish coins because they were accepted everywhere. And if you're a sailor and you are stopping in Havana or in Jamaica and in Hampton, you probably have a couple floating around. Uh, Delftware, which is a particular kind of ceramic, uh, bowl vessels and porringer handles. As I mentioned, there's this big change in the 1720s and 30s. One of them is the type of food people are serving if they are trying to be classy and genteel, and that's a transition away from stews and soups and things you can make in a one pot to individual vessel, individual plates, individual coffee cups, everybody's getting their own cut of different types of, uh, different courses, basically. From, so it's from a one uh, pot meal to courses of meals, uh, and then faunal remains because people are eating. I mentioned it's a question of scale, so that's a lot of tobacco pipes. There's a lot of tobacco pipes and a lot of wine bottles. So here is the excavation. These are the large post holes uh, from the Earthfast building. Here are steps going down into the building and a trash pit. That's a close up of the steps that went down into the building, uh, a rare archeological find and evidence of uh, very skilled archeological excavators. More, uh, Tobacco bowls and tobacco uh, stem fragments, again, all datable, which we like. One of the things that's often done and was done for the Goodyear site, it's also done for the carousel and the air and space site, is the artist reconstruction. So this shows what the site would have looked like between 1690 and 1730 before the brick building was built. So you've got the wooden building, you can see the entry into the cellar, which is where the steps were, and a kitchen, a small building, a small kitchen building, was also identified. The kitchen had a trash pit in it, or had a root cellar in it actually, uh, which is a type of pit that is often found in buildings where enslaved people lived. It's sort of like a locker, a hidey hole, a way to keep things away from view of the general public or um, the people that owned you. Um, in the root cellar, um, cowrie shells were recovered. Cowrie shells are, have been associated with enslaved Africans um, throughout colonial Virginia through archeological excavations. You can see the, uh, some of the other things that were found in the root cellar there. There's evidence of another tavern um, by the Goodyear site. Most of this tavern is currently still under uh, Settlers Landing Road. It's called the Bordland Tavern, run by John and Mary Bordland. Um, again, a lot of tobacco pipes. Uh, I should probably quantify that, but it's a lot of tobacco pipes and a well. So the well is a feature. This well is brick lined and then as you descend through the well, it becomes stone lined. And actually some of the stone is coral. So this really is probably ballast stone. 
Uh, you'll hear a lot about bricks being brought over from England as ballast. Probably not true because people were making bricks in Virginia early and often, and a lot of bricks were made in Colonial Virginia. It wouldn't make sense to bring them over. Uh, ballast on the stone, on the other hand, in a port like Hampton, it makes sense because they are readjusting the load as they are offloading. They are readjusting the load as they are loading. And so ballast stone would be something that would be available to build with. Uh, one of the buildings on the carousel site was in fact had a ballast stone foundation. Now we're gonna talk about these two sites just to get you located, Air and Space Museum, the carousel. Um, this is what we found. Again, a lot of stuff, densely packed, complex archeological sites. Uh, folks digging in the cold. It was cold there. Um, I was there, I was involved in digging this site up. Um, there we are, again, this is a archeological test, uh, is an archeological trash pit, lots of material, a uh, post hole. Post mold, this is what they look like when you're, uh, before they're excavated. Uh, trash pit, uh, well, that's Tom Higgins who uh, led the excavation. Uh, another trash pit with uh, creamware, uh, a creamware plate, which is a very high-end ceramic in the 18th century. So structure three, that's the tavern building. It was a tavern starting in the 1730s when it was built. It was a tavern run by Mrs. Taylor. You will see that the odd triangular shape that's a hearth in two rooms. So we know that there are at least two, maybe three or four rooms in this building. There were uh, trash pits, there was a well, there were gardening features, a lot of uh, features to provide uh, food. Uh, and a diverse food, like the garden, for the customers. There's another picture, it's a picture of the building being excavated. We found this Staffordshire salt. It is uh, an exceptionally rare archeological find. It is in fact on display here in the museum, or was last time I went through the display. And you can see in the, these are just two trash pits. We found 200 ceramic sherds, 183 pipe stems and bowls, and again, two Spanish coins. So this is a tavern, and there's a reference in the Virginia Gazette that when Mrs. Bro opens her tavern in the 1850s, she says, I'm opening across the street from where Mrs. Taylor ran her tavern. Now this gardening feature is an asparagus bed. Um, asparagus uh, being something bright green and crunchy that you could have at the tavern that you might not be able to get at home. These are just some numbers, right? So for the bunch of grapes, we have recovered 12,000 artifacts, most of them being glass and ceramic. So plates and bowls and, and bottles and wine glasses and things like that. The across the street, across King Street from the Bunch of Grapes was the King's Arms. And this is a little drawing of it. You can see that triangular shape that indicates a hearth in two rooms. Not that common in private homes. This is the dairy. As I mentioned, uh, it, as the 18th century progresses, diversity becomes important in diets and in Present, demonstrating that you are fashionable and classy, that you can serve a bunch of different foods. And so here, Mrs. Bro was making uh, cherry brandy and Bailey's Irish cream, basically. We found wine bottles that had evidence of both of those drinks in them. Again, we found 5,000 things at the King's Arms, ceramics, a lot of faunal material, so that's parts of animals. Here is our artist's rendering of it. So you have the bunch of grapes here and Mrs. Bro's uh, King's Arms Tavern there. So when I started working on my uh, thesis, I wanted to see how the taverns were reflecting this change that happened in Virginia society. And the way I chose to sort of figure out what to look for was to look at things called probate inventories, which are about um, 
which are lists of things that are in dead people's homes so that the estate can be settled. And the pattern that I kept noticing, and Mr. Uh, Bannister's uh, probate inventory has it, wealthy people like to serve a variety of food and drink, and they like to serve it on a variety of vessels. So he's got custard cups, other people have salad plates, other people have sweet meat plates. So it was the ability to serve more than one kind of food. So their kitchens have frying pans and bread ovens and the ability to roast meat on spits, whereas poorer folks have a pot to cook stew in. Same with coffee and tea and chocolate. Wealthier folks can have complete coffee sets, have complete tea sets, have complete chocolate sets, whereas poor folks have a teapot and a mug. So that's basically what this talks about, that you're looking for different foods, hot foods, cold foods, fried foods, baked foods, roasted foods, um, the ability to add mustard and vinegar and change the taste and to serve custard which also meant that you had somebody that knew how to make custard. Um, taverns had diverse ceramics, had diverse foods, the planting bed I talked about, the dairy I talked about, and to sort of cap all this off, Mrs. Brown, when she came, enjoyed a meal that was ham and turkey and breast of veal and oysters, and she drank Madeira wine and punch and cider. So she is in Colonial Hampton in the 1750s at what was at the time viewed as one of the best taverns in town. In fact, when he went down on his way to the Dismal Swamp, George Washington stayed at Mrs. Bro's tavern, the receipts in his records that he paid her. Um, so this is where elite in Virginia stayed and they could get a very complicated, very sophisticated meal. And now we'll just show some pictures. There, beer mugs, punch bowls, Chinese porcelain, punch bowl, Delftware, plate, Delftware. Delft is often decorated to mimic Chinese porcelain. Uh, whiteware, I'm sorry, creamware, very popular in the 18th century. I don't understand this, this is called Wieldenware. Um, people would eat off this. I would, it would disturb me greatly, but this is a extremely fashionable plate in the 1750s. It falls out of fashion pretty quickly, thankfully. And then I'll end with this. Um, vegetable wear was a trend in the 18th century. People had teapots. This one's a head of cauliflower. Their ears of corn, their pineapple, their variety of things. So the takeaway from the talk is Hampton and the residents of Elizabeth City County were aware of what the fashionable trends were in food, in drink, the probate inventories show people reading The Spectator, reading the history of the Duke of Marlborough in two volumes. So even though they were very far from the center of the English speaking world, they worked very diligently to follow the trends, follow the fashion, follow the styles. Thank you very much. And Chris, before we sign off, um, and good evening, I'm Seamus McGran. I'm the promotions director for the Hampton History Museum. We do have one question okay. for you, uh, actually from Lisa Garber, um, who uh, is a friend of the museum, used to be our volunteer coordinator. And she says, um, slightly off to topic, but Chris, where can we read about the archeology span at Fort Eustis? The archaeology at Fort Eustis, we have a uh, Facebook page uh, creatively called Fort Eustis Cultural Resource Management uh, because that's what the military calls archaeology and historic preservation. Um, so you can follow us on the Facebook. We also have a web page if you search for Fort Eustis Environmental. The archaeology program lives within the larger environmental program, so it's me and the folks that deal with the natural resources and the folks that make sure we comply with the air pollution laws and the water pollution laws. We all work together and we have our web page. And there we have a popular history, a history for the general public called Bound in a Brilliant Tide that we had put together a couple of years ago 
There is a manuscript by a former army historian named Emma Jo Davis that is about the Civil War. And we have some other stuff. Oh, there's a, uh, two papers that we recently did at the uh, Archaeological Society of Virginia conference on the architecture and archaeology of Fort Eustis and on our work to um, stabilize archaeological sites from, uh, prevent them from eroding into the James River. All right, Chris, thank you very much for a very informative uh, talk. I certainly have learned a great deal about the place I work every day, so thank you again for that. I'm Alan Holman, I'm the curator for the Hampton History Museum. Thank you for joining us at our Port Hampton lecture. And uh, we will see you next time. Keep an eye out for us on our web page and our Facebook page. We'll be posting uh, about upcoming events there. Thank you again.